All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, we're going to do a fast and loose watercolor painting utilizing just two colors, vermilion and indigo. So, I am going to saturate this quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. It's 140 pound paper, cold press, 100% cotton. Um, the major online realtors carry it, both um, Jerry's Artorama and uh, Blick.com. I'm not sure what other websites hold it, carry it, but I'm sure you can find it on Amazon or other uh, websites of your choice. So, uh, get this paper nice and soaked, and then we'll pour out the paints. I recently picked up a new um, palette, a new tin, and I had got it specifically for these two color paintings. Just makes things a lot easier. I'll kind of just have the complementary colors or what have you just across from each other. So we have Indigo, and this is Da Vinci brand, and my Vermilion is Hey, Hammy, is Van Gogh brand. I may have uh, an Indigo by Van Gogh brand, and at some point, I should try to stay within the brand and see what happens, or do the same thing with Da Vinci, but my Vermilion Da Vinci, I think, is a gouache, so I'll have to see. And both um, the Vermilions and the Indigo aren't true vermilion and our true indigo. I think vermilion is fugitive or has kind of toxic traits to it. I'm not sure if the same thing with indigo. And from what I've seen, indigo seems to be a mix of um, blues or blue and black. In this case, it's uh, Prussian blue and quinacridone violet. And the vermilion is PR254PY154, so a red and a yellow for those two. Okay, so this color combination had surprised me quite a bit when it had come out. Sorry for adjusting the camera right there. Um, when I used it, at first it looked kind of just ugly, and as the painting progressed, it, it really started to work out nice. So um, I don't know what it is or if these were traditionally used in two color, but I had done it with an experiment and it was just, I was really excited about it and I was really happy with how it came out. So. Then I had forgotten all about it, and I was looking through either Facebook or my phone, something like that, and a picture had popped up, and I was like, oh, yeah, that color combination. So we will now make up a scene with it. So we're going to paint wet and wet, fast and loose. We're going to use that technique that I always refer to. This one is taking a lot of pigment and feeding it in and using the paper towel, the hake, to go back and forth. Kind of that tonalist approach that's used by oil painters. Uh, Stuart Davies, David Usher, and uh, Dennis Sheehan. So I'm making up this scene, just kind of playing around with it. Um, we'll see what happens with it. It's more you know, exploratory, allowing y'all to see this combination of colors. Um, and like I said, at first, it looked downright disgusting. And then, a very nice kind of late day hazy painting appeared. So, we'll see what effect happens this time. Yeah. 
Yep, Hammy. Hammy has gotten to the point where he... Yep. What's up? Where he, um, he flies into the art room now. Like, I opened up the door to come in. And I looked, you know, to see if he was coming in. I didn't see him, and I closed the door. And, um, then I looked into the room, and, and there Hammy was. So he, uh, he made it in that fast without me seeing it. Seeing him. He was in here early while I was oil painting, which was nice. I did, um, want to point something out to y'all, and I figured it would happen in this video. I probably have mentioned I have a long beard and I just put some beard oil in it and washed my hands twice in the kitchen sink with you know dish soap because the beard oil beard balm is um, you know very thick stays on the hands and it kind of has the properties of acting like a resist anytime you have any lotion or anything like that on your hands um, or product hair stuff anything like that and get it on the paper it can resist and create a spot where the paint doesn't want to stay and that was happening right there you see how there's that white spot and that might be from the beard oil and like I said that was after washing my hands twice knowing and, and thinking to myself I'm putting this in and then I'm going to paint and I know that if it's on my hands it'll cause that and I had to tear paper to size. So always keep that in mind. Um, that that can happen. Also, uh, quite frequently, if you're on watercolor Facebook pages, like different art groups, um, arches, the loose stock, I think, has been having trouble with um, sizing issues. And I know I'm using uh, Stonehenge Aqua, but Arches is like the Cadillac, you know, like the, the really good watercolor paper, like fantastic. Um, but they've been having quality issues lately from what I've been reading from other people. But either addressing the, the seller, whatever company, or I think Arches itself, it's been, um, taken care of by the companies like that they've been replacing it so that's just something for you y'all to be wary of so while I push this back and forth and as of right now like I said it has a very distinctly ugly color combination at first but as we progress in this one, I think, and I'm not sure at what point it, it turns, but um, the color combination just starts to layer very beautifully. So hopefully I can build a nice composition in the meanwhile, just playing with the land masses, getting an idea of where I want things to go. Very additive, subtractive process. We haven't really lifted that much we could do that get a little tone up in here and wipe back just kind of go back and forth I also did take out um, the razor blade I'm thinking that we might do some textural effects on the painting with that, but we'll see. I'm putting this here. Thinking maybe planning out potential trees. See what happens. Let's bring up a little bit of foliage up on this side. It's wet and wet, so it'll diffuse. I'm 
bring this out in this direction so I don't get too much of a um, symmetry going on. So we have it kind of hanging over. We'll play around with it. We'll do a bend in the curve. So we'll have land mass. We'll come down. And that'll be the land structure. So we'll have an S shape composition. Just a really simple shape to build off of. Um, there is a book out there that I don't own. I have to look up the name of it. But if you Google the name or compositional shapes, there's there's a book with a section on that. I think a like kind of you know an older book. So it might be past its copyright date. I have to check and see. But anyway, I'm talking about a book I don't even know the name of, don't own. But that's something that we really need to explore in these videos is compositional shapes. A lot of the times I'm kind of just going with the flow, um, making it up as we go along, but also um, experimenting more with pigment and tonal values and textures as opposed to uh, landscape composition. And we even progressed as far as to playing with inks underneath our paint but what direction we should go in I'm gonna say we just us in this video just YouTube series is um, you know just start looking at um, shapes working from photographs kind of distilling the scene that's the title of one of um, Ron Rance's books I don't own that book, but um, the concept of minimizing and not including everything that you see within a photograph, within a landscape, is an important skill. So that's something we can go over one day. But now we're kind of building up our pigment concentration. We're darkening the, the banks of this stream. Very easy to create that, that curve right there. With the wet and wet, just simply going up and down on that um, water's edge, we'll create your under shadow and the reflection of your, your trees. With this uh, two pigment back and forth process, you do utilize a lot of paint. It's probably because we're using a tree from the tube, we're using the hake brush, so we are using quite a bit, but uh, we're also working wet and wet. So there's the pigment diffusion and it's sinking into the um, the fibers of the paper essentially from what I understand is that when you you wet the watercolor uh, paper the cotton um, the woven fibers open up and the pigment sits down underneath better so this technique is more suited personally, I think, towards the um, Cotman brands, the Van Gogh, the Da Vinci brands. Right, Hammy? What do you think about that? What you want, buddy? So the, the, the kind of brands where you're spending um, two, two fifty or $3 to to ten dollars a tube, um, and I say ten dollars a tube because some of the Da Vinci brands, if you're 
looking for, let's say, quinacridone rose, um, quinacridone gold, sorry. Um, you're not going to find that in the Cotman brands or the, uh, the Van Gogh brands. And you don't want to go with other um, student brands unless they have um, light fast information. Those two, the Cotman and the Van Gogh, will help quite a bit. Um, and they have just great light fast capabilities. I am curious if we used a uh, Daniel Smith, let's say. I'm looking in the screen, it's a little tilted, so let me see if I can fix that. There we go. Uh, if we use like Daniel Smith brand, which um, is a high quality hand processed um, watercolor paint, chances are you guys have heard about Daniel Smith. They have it on Blick, and I think they have it Jerry's Artorama. You can also find it at Michael's, I believe. And having a higher pigment load, um, I'm curious about the quantity that would get be used. But I do have a few of those paints. Maybe one day we'll do that as an experiment. So we have a pretty interesting composition set up. So far, we've only used the hake. We did maybe a little bit of paper towel in the sky. Not really that much. Um, let's grab the number one rigger. We probably don't need to go much more beyond that in terms of brushes. Put a little bit of that vermilion down here. We're going to play with this guy, wet and wet, to start to add a little bit more defined elements in these masses. Now, what we're doing here is just taking this rigger and tracing out tree branches, trunks, etc. In this stage, with the wet and wet, it's going to diffuse, it's going to lighten up, and not too much of it will be seen at the end. So you can kind of go loosey goosey with it. And it will help um, just kind of build the overall image that's taking place, though. You can even take the paper towel and lift out highlights of trunks, which is uh, very common with the oil painting approach of tonalism in this uh, kind of fast and loose. And those uh, three oil painters I mentioned at the beginning have a lot of uh, videos dedicated to that, um, that style and that approach. I have a few oil painting videos up using it. It's just um, the, the camera and the lighting is just so hard to get with oil paints, with the reflection and whatnot. However, right here, I'm taking a paper towel rolled up and pushing it along to do some lifting to add some uh, highlights. And then we'll come back in and add darks. But anyway, what was I saying? Yeah, I do have a few videos up there with the oils. Um, showing that technique but for some reason lighting and filming is super hard for me with oil paints and i don't know if it's the glossiness of fresh oil or the lighting angle but i have a lot of uh, difficulty with that i have since changed the lights in my art room and by art room i mean we rent a two-bedroom house and this one room is dedicated to me painting in it. Um, I took off the cover of the overhead light. It was just um, one of those really old 40s to 70s um, 
yellowish. Yeah, Hammy. You want to go out? Let me open the door so Hammy can go in the other room real quick. Yep. There you go. So, um, yeah, it was one of those, like, kind of old light covers. And I took that off, and it had just, the, you know, old tube lights. And, um, we could do a little scraping. And I replaced that with two bulbs that I got from uh, Lowe's. I had looked for kind of the higher lumens that I can get and ones that had a color temperature that was more towards natural light. Reason being is that from what I've been told and from what I understand is that the natural light or painting under different colored lights can affect the ultimate result of how you view your painting during the process. And then at the end, it could be more blue or more yellow, depending on the lighting you used, how you're viewing it underneath. But that's probably more of a big deal for people that are painting uh, realism. Anywho, I changed those two lights. And I have the two desk lamps on either side. And then I have a third one right here that swivels. And... Um, provides more light as well. So I have a lot of different lights going on and um, maybe we could try doing an oil painting video again soon if that's something you all want to see. Uh, maybe I can get it filmed good. I could also set up the phone that I'm filming with on a tripod and have it over my shoulder and put the painting on an easel and film on that but the pochade box which is you know kind of the portable painting boxes that I have um, the easel that I have for it is just a regular camera easel and it's not the strongest but um, like strong heavy duty um, tripods for a pochade box are kind of really expensive. Now they, I, they could probably sixty to eighty dollars starting for one that would really handle the weight. So we'll see about that. Something that I would like to do if you all would like to see. That's probably a good segue into me saying, hey, if you ever want to support me. Uh, down below I have linked the Patreon account and I would love for you to consider um, you know supporting out two cheap tiers and I do have some exclusive content that I put up there. I also do have links down below to um, the Etsy account and Instagram. I haven't posted on Instagram in a while but I need to do that. Oh yeah, also just simply considering uh, liking, subscribing, and following is very helpful to this channel. I would like to hit a thousand subscribers on the YouTube channel. I think that gives you the option to then do like a YouTube live. And I would love to go live on YouTube and, and film like that. as you can tell, my editing is very raw and non-existent. And as of right now, I mean, that's mainly because all this content is free. But I don't mind going with the flow and, you know, talking while I paint. In fact, like right now, I'm filming this live on Twitch, and I don't think anybody's watching it live, apparently. But, um, I find it, I don't know, I just, just enjoy the process. Okay. 
So now you can see we're starting to build up our um, darks, our more pure pigment. The paper is starting to dry quite a bit. So let's um, play around with these tree structures, the textures, the scrapes. Because once you put in right like that, you can then scrape all through those areas because you now just created more wet spots. And then as we dry, we can then from there put in super dark pigment and then we'll achieve a depth and density within our painting. So we kind of use um, tonal values. Well, we, yeah, we use tonal values to create depth and we use linear perspective to create depth. We use those two objects, um, not objects, um, concepts. So let's see, let's put out some more indigo. This is straight from the tube, straight from the tube mix. And we're gonna try to build up our darks. Oh, still damp right there. That's fine, we can get. Oh, of course my phone's gonna make a noise. Let me turn this off. There we go. Scrape a little rock structures. trees put reflections down of those lights the highlights what I'm going to do now is dry off so I'm going to use the uh, blow dryer so if you have headphones on just watch out it's going to take about 10 seconds For our purposes you can feel at the back of your hand it still feels some cooled spots so there's some moisture there but it won't affect this layer so we have straight from the tube We're using the hake brush texturize We may have to get a little bit of water. And if you ever find like you have too much water on the hake, put down a little more paint. Uh, paint. Also, this approach is kind of fun with um, paints you do you don't use that often, like. I rarely use vermilion or indigo. Um, indigo I use 
if I'm using quinacridone rose and um, what's the other one? Brown matter, kind of like a three color palette with that. So it has like it's kind of super special usage for me. So as you amass paints, there's different ones you can um, <laughs> you don't use as often or just has kind of specific applications. And if you have that tube sitting there, if you have a tube like Indian yellow or something like that, that maybe you didn't use for a long time, you know, pull it out, mix it with um, something else and, and try it out. You know, with uh, yellow, we've been doing the dioxine purple, but I'm sure you can do some other interesting mixtures. So this is heavier application. So it is um, wetter than the straight from the tube right now. So it um, has that darker gloss to it. And hoping we'll get a nicer drying effect taking place. I really need to fix this camera. Let me um, fix this for y'all. I'm so sorry about that. It's that the, um, the cord is pulling down on the side that should be good. So now here's going to be a good mix on the rigger. So now we're doing a darker application here. Uh, this is the number one rigger. So we were kind of just staying within the two. Um, we sometimes pull out the number four rigger. It holds kind of you know, just a better quantity, but may not have the um, the finer point, or at least my hands are too heavy to get that finer point. You could, instead of the rigger, utilize um, the squirrel mop. And the squirrel mop, I think, is capable of holding that point. As well as the different, you know, Chinese brushes. So whatever works for you. So these ones are going to be more prevalent in the finer final picture. So I'm trying to maintain, or at least create, a variety. And being careful that I don't do parallel lines or um, curves from one that mimic another one. So this is a good point, you know, to get that variety of nature in there. And at this stage, the painting is essentially um, now at the point where you can kind of tickle it as far as you want, or you know, stop it whenever you you know feel like it. You know, bring down whatever reflections you want to emphasize, and play around with whatever else is taking place. You really don't have to um, do as much detail with this. And I think this is often the stage where people are worried about overworking. So 
So just keep that in mind. Both little birds. We didn't play around with the the razor at all. So let's take a look, see if there's anything we want to do. Of course, if you're following along from these videos and you wind up using a razor blade while you're painting, you know, please be careful. I guess I am not liable for anything that you can do to uh, hurt yourself. So just be careful. Um, anywho, you can use it to pick out little groupings of highlights you can create little effects of um, grouping of wildflowers I find that this works the best when the paper is completely dry so uh, some areas are wet so it's not gonna be the best but yeah you know, I'm trying not to do too much blow drying in the video lay it flat and pull for a textured effect let's see now we'll do a final dry off and then put a mat over it and we'll call it done So, um, for the most part, uh, we can call this one done just in the interest of time. And um, once again, it's just a mixture of vermilion and indigo um, to kind of create a neutral and get some individualized washers where those show through um, uniquely, which is pretty cool. Could have brought some more down into this uh, water that's being reflected up. But um, overall, it's just another fun two-color combination that you can add to experiment with and play around with tonal values. So I hope you enjoyed. And mat over it. Let's see what that looks like. There we go. And I will talk to you all soon. Take care.